And as you find your seats, if you want to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. It's been our tradition at the beginning of every year, the first Sunday of every year, thank you, to do a message on prayer. We're going to tweak that tradition just slightly this morning, and we're going to talk about fasting. Uh, don't, don't be nervous. I trust this will actually be an enjoyable opportunity for us. <laughs> but fasting is one of those words that when you, you say it, it's similar to evangelism and prayer that people often tremble and cringe a bit. But I, I, I actually am, am greatly excited about this opportunity. I was speaking to someone. I mentioned that this was going to be the the topic, and, and one of the first things they said was, oh, I just am always worried I don't do it right. And it, it, uh, it, it struck me that it could be that a lot of people think of, of fasting with that way. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. And so part of my goal in this message is, is to, uh, to free any of us from that kind of burden. I mean, I guess it's possible to do a fast wrong, but that, that really has more to do with uh, pride in our hearts than some kind of practical... Uh, uh, practice we might might do inaccurately. I, I, I believe actually this passage in Mark is going to motivate us. It's going to encourage us. I, I think it's going to inspire us for the joy, the opportunity that I think we have before us and something that we as pastors want to set in place this year as a regular practice in our church. So would you read with me? This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant word. It has the power to transform us and to bring us joy even in such a discipline as fasting. Read this with me. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then, then, they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Now, right off the bat, it's, it's possible that there could be some people here who have no idea what this word fast means, and therefore this story is... Uh, makes no sense. Uh, if you think of fast primarily in terms of speed or, or running, and you're wondering uh, what they're asking about these disciples of John and the Pharisees and, and why they are uh, maybe sprinters, um, that's not the word fast and how it's used in the scriptures. Uh, the word fast here, it simply refers to a voluntary giving up food for a period of time. Uh, that's a different definition of the word fast. To fast is where we get our English word break fast, breakfast from. We, we voluntarily give up food for a period of time, in this case for some religious purpose. That's what a, a fast is. So this story centers around this idea, and the story kind of breaks down into two simple sections. First, there's a question, there's a question, and then there's an answer from Jesus. I just want to walk through the story, and then we'll use the second half of the message to apply it to our souls. There's a question, and then there's an answer. And it all has to do with this topic of fasting, taking a break from food for some period of time. As, as I was thinking about this topic, I, I, one of my sons um, sort of needs to know what the next meal is going to be. And interestingly, he doesn't actually like to eat very much. He, he, he requires an amazing amount of parental help uh, to eat very little amount of food. But he needs to know what the next meal is, even though we know he's not actually going to eat a lot of that meal. Uh, but he wants to know. So almost every night before he goes to bed, one of the last things he'll ask me is, what is for breakfast tomorrow? 
And he's, I don't know, it helps him sleep or something. Well, it's oatmeal or yogurt or whatever it is. But, but he wants to know. And I think there's something in the human condition that God has, has built in that we, we are sort of looking ahead to the next meal. It's partially because we're dependent on food. No one can live uh, without food indefinitely. God has made food as a gift and a symbol of our dependence on him. Only God is self-sustaining. And food is one of these reminders that we are not self-sustaining, that God has to provide for us. And so, like my son, and I think a lot of people, we look ahead to the next meal. We, we, we look forward to it. We anticipate it. We experience hunger. And even when we're not particularly hungry, in some ways we sort of mark our days by the next meal. I know that's very true for homemakers. Because they're having to make the next meal. I've told people that when my wife has to go uh, visit family or something, and I happen to be watching the children the few times I've actually uh, braved this responsibility, I, I typically measure the time left by how many meals I have to prepare. It's not about hours. It's not even about nights. It's about, okay, I have seven meals left to make. God help me. And, and that's typically how I measure the meals. And I think people do that as well. God has built meals into our regular rhythm. We look forward to it. It's a marker of our dependence on God. And so fasting is this temporary breaking from what is a very normal and very good rhythm, a God-given rhythm. The Bible comprehensively views food as a gift from God. It's not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a provision of God. It's to remind us of our dependence on God and God's generosity with us. He actually compares himself to food in many ways. And so it's a good thing. So fasting is, is giving up this good thing in order to seek something else, in order to seek something greater. So the question that starts this parable is the people noticing a contradiction. If you notice that in verse 18, John, that's John the Baptist, look down at your Bibles, John the Baptist, his disciples have this practice of fasting, of voluntarily giving up a meal or a series of meals, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. And so the question comes in two parts. Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, we don't know because we haven't interviewed them precisely why John's disciples fasted and the Pharisees' disciples fasted. But in light of the history of fasting in Israel, it's not too difficult to imagine why some of the reasons why they might be fasting. Uh, fasting for the people of God was, first of all, something that God had commanded them to do, specifically on the Day of Atonement when the, the animals were sacrificed to be a, a, a symbolic substitute for sin. They fasted on that day. And then there's fasting actually <coughs> throughout the pages of the Old Testament. There's a number of, of locations where people fasted. Let me just run through a number of them. First of all, Moses went without food for 40 days when he was meeting the Lord and receiving the Ten Commandments. The people of Israel fasted on a number of occasions as a group when they were mourning for sin or longing for God's deliverance in some way. The exiles in Babylon fasted and prayed for Esther when she was petitioning the king for their deliverance. They fasted in that moment. Nehemiah fasted when he was grieving for the destruction of Jerusalem and longing for God's restoration. And as we heard last week, the woman would fast and pray in the temple as she waited for the coming of the Messiah. In the New Testament, in the church in Antioch, there is fasting and praying when they are calling, uh, receiving the calling to send out Paul and Barnabas to go plant churches in the Mediterranean. And then Paul and Barnabas fast and pray when they set up elders in the new churches that they've formed. So fasting is this practice that's peppered throughout the scriptures. And I think if we could, we could summarize it, what we're, what we're really saying it is and throughout the scriptures, and we could maybe guess that this is what the disciples of the Pharisees and John were seeking to do, is they're setting aside food as a symbolic and tangible expression of their longing for God. If I could just summarize fasting in all of its forms, that's probably what I would say. It's setting aside food as a tangible, symbolic expression of longing for God. It has a component of mourning for sin, 
of, of voluntarily acknowledging that there's, there's something that has separated people from God at some times. Often it has this element of deliverance, longing for God to move in deliverance. Often it just has this idea of, of acknowledging that God is what the people need even more than food. That's the idea. It's a tangible way of saying that as much as I need this food, and I do, I, I can't fast forever, I will die. But I can temporarily set it aside as a way of declaring to you, I need you even this much. The way God made human bodies, it's not difficult to see why setting aside food for any amount of time would, would be a tangible expression of something really valuable to God. If you've never fasted, it doesn't take long for you to experience your dependence, your weakness, your need. Uh, you know that what's that like even, even when you, you accidentally forget a meal, uh, which some of us never do, but there's people that I know that they forget a meal. Uh, it's uh, odd to me, but they, they forget a meal, so there's a moment and they think, oh, I, I forgot to eat breakfast and lunch today. And now I'm ravenous. You know that experience. It's the sense of your body indicating to you, you are a dependent creature. You have needs. You have physical needs. Well, fasting is kind of doing that intentionally as a way of saying to God, I need you more than anything, even more than food. Actually, sacrificing things for the sake of a desire is actually very common in our human experience. You might think, for example, of an athlete who sacrifices all of his afternoons and evenings in order to prepare for the Olympics. Or, or, or you might think of, of, of for example, a, a mother who sacrifices her, her days and her afternoons to care for her children. What's happening? A, a greater thing, a thing that is consuming, is causing you to give up things you deem to be lesser. A, a, a mountain climber gives up the comfort and security of solid ground because he wants the experience of attaining the heights of the mountain. It's just common human experience. When you want something greater, you give up those things you deem to be lesser. That's what fasting is. So it's not too difficult to determine an answer to the first part of this question. Why were John's disciples and the Pharisees fasting? Well, they're fasting because, to their understanding, they want more of God. They want to acknowledge their need for God. They want to acknowledge their vulnerability before God. They want God to move and restore his people. They want God to be present with his people again. That's why they're fasting. But the question is, if that's happening with John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? There's a subtle implied rebuke. Are they spiritually lazy? Do they not care about the restoration of God's people? Are they overfed? They just desire their next meal more than they want God? Why don't your disciples fast? Are you claiming to be something more than John the Baptist or the Pharisees that your disciples do not fast? Are you daring to imply that we don't need God to come among us? Are you daring to say that all these other religious people, they're longing for God to move among them, but your disciples don't seem to indicate any great desire. They're certainly not fasting. Why don't your disciples, Jesus, why don't they fast? Why don't they tangibly, symbolically express their longing for God to be among his people? Why don't they mourn for the separation from God, from his people? Why don't they hunger after the presence of God with his people? Why don't your disciples fast, Jesus? Then comes the answer. Jesus, as he often did, would answer a question with a question. His question would expose the assumptions of the original question and would lead to his answer. Jesus answered them, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus essentially uses three metaphors, one after the other, all to connect with people at a very obvious level. Jesus is always doing this. He's using obvious examples, things you know obviously to make a spiritual point. So the first metaphor he uses is a wedding. 
He's saying, well, can you imagine there's a, a date set for this wedding celebration and the groomsmen and the bridegroom have gathered together for the great feast to celebrate the wedding and one of the groomsmen, when the plate comes to him, says, no, no, I've designated this day as a day of fasting and mourning. Jesus is saying, how offensive would that be? This is my wedding day and you've chosen to fast on my wedding day? This is my great day of celebration. I mean, in our, in our modern culture, it might be something like if you can imagine, let's say the big birthday party comes and here comes the birthday party, the, the great moment, we're celebrating this moment and then someone comes and says, no, no, today I'm fasting. I came to the party just so I could tell you I don't want any birthday cake. Precisely because... I'm fasting. Jesus saying, no, the, 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 the guests of the groom, they, they can't fast when the bridegroom is with them. This is a time of celebration. This is a time of joy. This is a time of, of feasting. This is not a time of mourning. This is a time of joy. You know that, right? You know how in a wedding it would be ridiculous for one of the guests to say, I just want everyone to know I'm in mourning on this day and I will not be eating any of the wedding meal." How foolish would that be? Fasting is inappropriate when it's a time of celebration. He goes on to another metaphor. He says, okay, let's, let's, let's move on from the wedding metaphor. Let's imagine you have this wonderful favorite old cloak. And you love it, but it has a tear. And you're going to patch that tear. Now, we don't patch tears, most of us. But, but in this culture, this is just as obvious as the wedding example. He's saying, look, here, there's a tear on this old garment, and you have this new piece of cloth that everyone knows is going to shrink once it's washed. But knowing that, you, you sew it onto this hole, and you know the moment you wash this, it's just going to tear away, and it's going to make the hole worse. You say, how foolish would that be? What kind of person, knowing that's going to happen, knowing that it's just going to ruin, it's going to ruin this garment, it's going to make it worse, you don't use a brand new unshrunk cloth on an old garment. That's already, it's just going to tear, it's going to make it worse. Same point. That doesn't fit this situation. He goes on to the third metaphor. You can notice in your Bibles, look, he says, look, no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Now, I would venture to guess that no one here has a wineskin. Probably, if you do, God bless you. I don't think you have, probably have a wineskin. But again, in this culture, this was obvious. This was an obvious thing. Look, he's saying, wouldn't it be ridiculous? You can almost imagine people chucking. Oh, what, kind of, what kind of a fool puts new wine in an old wineskin? Everybody knows what's going to happen. You have this expensive wine, you have this old wineskin. What's going to happen? You pour it in, immediately it's going to explode. The wine's ruined, the wineskin's ruined. Neither are good for anything. Jesus is using these obvious examples to make this very subtle, powerful point. Let me answer your question. Why don't my disciples fast? Would a bridegroom fast or a groomsman fast on the wedding day? Of course not. Would you, would you put a, a new cloth on an old garment knowing it's just going to tear the garment and ruin both? No, of course we wouldn't do that. Would you put new wine in old wine skins? No, of course we wouldn't do that. It would, just, it would just explode the skins. Everything would be ruined. You don't do that. There's just certain things that go together. Yes. Certain things that go together. That's right. And fasting, the point of fasting is longing for the presence and work of God to be manifest among his people. Fasting is about desiring that which is not. It's about wanting to see the unseen. It's about hungering for what you do not have. It makes no sense to do that when the thing you're longing for is already upon you. It makes no sense to do that when the thing you're hungering for is right in your midst. It would make no sense to fast for God if God is among you. It would make no sense to long and mourn for God to come to restore his people in the moment when God is restoring his people. That's not the time of longing. That's the time of celebration. That's the time of joy. Fasting is about a season of faith. When you want to see, and Jesus is saying, this is not a season of faith. This is a season of sight. God is here. The bridegroom is among his friends. 
the new wine has come. And no, there's nothing fitting about fasting in these circles when I am literally walking around God in the flesh, healing and raising and proclaiming forgiveness and restoring and announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There is no place for fasting. It doesn't fit. Actually, it doesn't just not fit. It is offensive. It would be wrong to fast in the presence of Jesus just as surely as it will be wrong to fast in heaven. There will be no fasting in heaven because there will be no more longing for anything, only enjoying. You notice he inserts here that this season of non-fasting is temporary. And that's the main reason I I chose this passage to talk about this morning. This season of non-fasting is temporary. Notice what he says. Notice what he says. The day will come, verse 20, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. They will fast in that day. Now, I, I, I imagine that these metaphors were totally lost on those asking the question. Can you just please give us a straight answer? I, I just want to know why you don't fast. Well, bridegrooms, and I, I'm sure they were, they were confused. But for those with eyes of faith to see and his disciples, I think the meaning began to reveal itself. The day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. A commentator William Lane makes a point about Jesus' use of the word that day Uh, to reference the time when they will fast. And he he says many times when Jesus is talking about the future, he he calls them uh, these days. These days. These days that are coming, certain things will happen. People will do this and that and the other thing. But in this passage, he says that day. And so I think there is, for this passage, an initial moment where there will be fasting and then an ongoing principle of fasting that we can apply to ourselves. I think the initial moment is worth worth highlighting. The the primary fast that was commanded in the Old Testament took place on the Day of Atonement. It was the day of days. Now, they fasted at other times, certainly, but this was the day. This was the day. This was the Day of Atonement, the day when sins were paid for, the day when sins were expiated. This was the day. And I think it's a a, a good comment that probably a primary fulfillment that Jesus is referring to is there's going to be a day when the bridegroom will be taken from these followers and they will fast in that day. I think primarily, primarily, he is focused on the day when the Son of Man gives his life as a ransom for sinners. He's contrasting the moment when Jesus is alive and breathing and healthy and with his disciples and that day when he is bleeding and dying and succumbing to death for the sake of his disciples. He's saying there's going to come a day when it's right to mourn. There's going to come a day where it's right to long. There's going to come a day where it's right to hunger and thirst. It's going to be that day when Jesus says it is finished and they watch his eyes close and his body sag in death as he pays for their sins. And in that day, oh, fasting. Fasting is going to be the absolutely appropriate thing to do. Appropriate for Peter and John and James and Andrew to fast on that day because their Lord, the bread of life, has gone into the grave to pay for their sins. And so, yes, is fasting right when they can no longer see him? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Fasting was right in that day. And I think there's an ongoing fulfillment. Because there is a sense in which, though the Lord Jesus is with us by his spirit, he is not with us physically. He is not with us in the way that he will be with us when we see him face to face. 
And I think that's why you see Jesus even instructing about how you are to do fasts in such a way that you're not boasting in it or showcasing it in front of others. I think that's why the early church fasted when they were seeking God to move among them and planting churches. I think because they sensed an ongoing fulfillment of Jesus' prediction. The day will come when the Lord would not be with his church in the same way. And in that day and in those subsequent days, yes, they will fast. They will fast. They will fast because though they have seen more of God's glory in Christ than had ever been seen before, there is a sense in which, once again, they are living by faith and not by sight. Like those people in the first covenant, they they are once again looking to the future. They are once again longing for the promise to be fulfilled. They're once again longing for the fulfillment to be seen, to be realized, to be experienced. And and yes, fasting is just such a discipline for that kind of time. And I think the church has a responsibility to fulfill Jesus' prediction that when the bridegroom is not physically with his bride, it is right for the friends of that bridegroom to fast. It is right for them to long. It is right for them to hunger. It is right for them to desire because they live by faith and not by sight and they want to see God move tangibly. They want to see the the risen Lord through his spirit do mighty things in his bride. They want to see things because their life exists in a place of faith and not sight. Fasting is longing for God, is mourning because our hearts or the hearts of those around us need to be closer to him, longing for the witnessing of his power and glory and work in our hearts and life. It's it's an expression of our awareness that though we have the spirit of Christ within us, in this world we are still distracted and drawn away from the glory of Christ. Sins entangle us. Distractions ensnare us, and heaven can seem distant from our minds. Fasting is a practical way of saying that we long for God more than anything in this world. It does not make Christ closer to us, but it expresses our desire that he would reveal his glory and his power in our hearts and lives in this world. Because of this, we want to renew a practice that we did a few years ago. We want to do it again this year. We're going to call it the first week fast. What we mean by that, for the sake of reminders, is because we're all forgetful, is on the first Sunday of each month this year, we're going to remind us as a church that that week we are designating as a time of fasting. Now, you're welcome to fast whenever you want, uh, but we're going to do it corporately in a particular way following the first Sunday of every month. Now, A couple of caveats about fasting. Uh, Fasting could take place at all levels and probably will in this church. I would not encourage you to go find every book on fasting you can in the world and read it because you will find a lot of nonsense and it will not serve your soul. All we are recommending here is that at some point over the course of this week, you set aside something some meal or some type of food, or it could be a series of meals. Some of you might even fast a whole week. Great. If you want to fast a meal in the week, a day in the week, a week, a type of food, something that you set aside as a tangible expression of saying, God, we want to see your glory among us. Now, an important caveat. Fasting does not make you more justified before God. All right? You're not going to get to heaven faster if you fast. Now, if you fast long enough, you will. But you're not going to get to heaven faster if you fast. You're not going to be more glorified, you know, in in terms of God's love for you if you fast. God's not going to forgive all your sins if you fast. It has none of those atoning qualities, okay? It's just a way of saying to the Lord, we love you and we want you. And we mourn for those things that lead us away from you. And we want more of you in our midst. If you are physically incapable of fasting food, and some of you may be, maybe good reasons not to fast food in this season. Your doctor may not recommend it, or you may know of some physical need that you have that makes it unwise. Let me encourage you. We are not encouraging you to fast if it's physically unwise. 
It may be that there could be another thing that you could substitute for food as a tangible way of saying, God, I want you more than this thing. Actually, for, for many of us, I might encouraging, encourage you to look at other things that you might fast in addition to food. I, I'm looking at that myself. Uh, maybe aspects of, of screen time would be a good example. Is there, is there times in the day where you, you want to fast looking at a screen? That could be a good example. Are there certain aspects of media, news media, social media, entertainment media, that you, you want to fast for a period of time? Uh, that could be a, a great expression of this. Let me, let me make one encouragement, though, with those caveats in place. It doesn't justify you, and don't do it if it's unhealthy. However, I'd like to encourage all of us to, to make a decision about something that we are going to feel over the course of the week. Fasting makes no sense if you're technically fasting the thing that you forget most of the time anyway. So if you're like me, which I've done this, and there's a season of fasting, and you normally forget like breakfast or something, it's not, it's not good to say, well, <laughs> I'm fasting breakfast, when you normally forget breakfast anyway. It, it, that's not really the spirit of what's going on here. The, the point is pick something that you do value, that you cherish, that you look forward to. That's a good thing in your life that you enjoy. And temporarily, set that aside and substitute it for a time of prayer and longing for the Lord and declaring your need for him. So don't fast something that you would never miss. Fast something that you will miss. And, and push yourself a bit on this. It's going to be more effective the more you feel the hunger for that thing and you force your soul to direct that hunger towards the Lord and say, yes, Lord, you, you know I'm feeling this, miss, I'm missing this right now and I want you to know I long for you more than this thing. So pick something that you'll miss. If you won't even miss a meal, you know, then, then maybe it's two meals. If, if, if you think, but this is, this is an easy thing, I don't even have to sacrifice to give up this thing, pick, pick something that you will feel. But 12 time this year, and you're welcome to do it more than that, we'd like to set aside this time as, as a church to declare our longing for the Lord. We want to be fasting primarily for three things. I want to give you three categories. Now, there's, there's so many things that we could be praying because we want to see God move. We, we want to see a move uh, in our country. We want to see a move in the government. We want to see a move around the world in church plants. We want to see a move in the suffering church. We want to see him move in, in sending out evangelists from our midst. We want to see a move in unity. I mean, you could just, the list goes on and on and on. But I want to give you three categories that as pastors, we feel in a particular way. At the very least, whatever else you pray for, we'd like to invite you. Pray with us about these things. Pray with us about these three things. We want to fast to see the glory of Christ in Scripture. We want to fast to see the holiness of Christ in our character. And we want to fast to see conversions to Christ in our community. So whatever else you are praying for and declaring your longing for God for with this thing, let's, let's at least all of us be praying about these things. Now, let me go through them one at a time. We want to see the glory of Christ in Scripture. This is a crucial, crucial need. Let me, let me read you this quote from John Owen just to feel the sobriety of this. John Owen, in The Glory of Christ, says this, No man shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight hereafter who does not in some measure behold it here by faith. It's a sobering warning. It's a sobering warning. It means if we go through life bored by Jesus... We should have no expectation that we're going to see him and come into his kingdom where the whole point is beholding the glory of Christ. It's a good indicator of the health of our souls, whether we are re regularly spiritually seeing the glory of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. So we want to fast for that. We want to pray that God would reveal his glory to us in the scriptures. We, we, are, we are fasting that this would take place privately so that when we open God's word in our homes with our personal time of studying his word, that we would see his glory, that it would be unveiled to us, that these wouldn't just be words, they would be windows exposing the glory of Jesus Christ. We're also fasting for this publicly, that on Sunday morning we will encounter glory through the preaching and singing of God's word on Sunday. 
I personally would like to ask your prayer for this and for me, for, for Bart, for Aaron, when we preach on Sunday, that you would please pray that God would illuminate his word. Charles Spurgeon, when asked uh, about his preaching, he said, the secret of it, of it is that my people pray for me. We would like to pray that, that God would illuminate his word. We're going to be going in to a lengthy series in the book of Philippians starting next week. I, I am so excited because that book is all about how our life is found in Jesus Christ. We want to pray that, that he would reveal his glory to us in the scriptures as we sing and as we listen to his word. Let, let's fast and pray that that would happen. Every first week of the month that we would be longing, God, reveal your glory in your word to us. Let it not bore us. Let us not be distracted from it. Let us not assume we already know these things. Let us see and taste the glory of Christ in your word. John Piper says this. This is how God has designed the scriptures to work for human transformation and for the glory of God. This is how. This is how he has designed the scriptures to work. The scriptures reveal God's glory. This glory, God willing, is seen by those who read the Bible. The seeing gives rise by God's grace to savoring God above all things, treasuring him, hoping in him, feeling him as our greatest reward, and tasting him as our all-satisfying good. That's what we are praying for. That's what we're fasting for. We're saying, Lord, I'd rather have a sight of your glory in the scriptures than have lunch today, or dinner today, or this screen time this week. I want to see your glory in your word. Second category. We're fasting to see the holiness of Christ in our character. The sight of God's glory in Christ in the scriptures is always meant to lead to the reflection of his character in our lives. Very important, our holiness does not save us. We are not justified by our righteousness. But those who know Christ increasingly reflect his holiness. His love, his righteousness, his purity, his steadfastness, his obedience, it's reflected in our lives. Our lives are conformed to the image of God in Christ. Fasting itself is an expression that we want to look like our Savior. And actually, fasting will reveal parts of us that are not conformed to Jesus and have been satisfied by food or other things. Richard Foster says this about fasting. More than any other discipline, fasting reveals. It reveals the things that control us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We cover up what is inside us with food and other things. Right. Let me just prepare you. <clears throat> if you're actually sacrificially fasting, and not just doing the things you don't miss anyways, <clears throat> but if you're actually fasting, <laughs> you're going to notice certain cravings, certain temperaments, certain character traits come out that have been temporarily satisfied or covered over or or, 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 or appeased by food or whatever else you're fasting. You're, you're going to notice somewhere there's been a false meal that's been fed to an idol in your life. Right. Tr trust me. I mean, you know what your kids get like when they're hungry. You're going to get like your kids when you're hungry. You're going to notice it. Well, what do we do with that? That's a moment to realize that's always in there. It's just been whitewashed over by the next meal. And I want it to get out so that I can take it to the foot of the cross, I can repent of it, and I can find my all in Jesus. Amen. Distracting yourself from loneliness by going to the next movie is not what you're designed for. Distracting yourself from anger by going to the next meal is not what you're designed for. Those things are meant to be brought to Jesus Christ, to be purged and presented to him so that you can find in him your all. When we fast, we are turning away from sin and turning toward the Lord. We are asking him to cleanse and purify us. And actually, we want this 
because we want to see more of God. As we grow in holiness, which we are asking for by fasting, we are revealing our need for by fasting, we are actually hoping that our sight of God's glory will be exposed in increasing measure to us. This is what Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there's, this, there's a certain beneficial cycle We fast as an expression of our desire, our longing for God to purify us. In fasting, we see those things where our hearts are not pure and have been satiated by food and other things. And in taking those things to the Lord as we turn away from those idols, we are able then to see more of God's glory. That's the goal, the goal of all this. And we're fasting and praying, longing, God, purify me. And trust me, if we pray that prayer, the Lord will answer it, sometimes painfully, Because sin always gets uprooted first by exposing it. And that's always the most painful part. But then there is repentance and grace and forgiveness and transformation and doing the whole thing all over again. That's what we're fasting for. Lord, we want holiness. Finally, we are fasting for conversions in our community. There is no miracle that displays the glory of Jesus Christ more than a dead heart being made alive. If we want to see the glory of Jesus, the very reason that those disciples should not have been fasting is that they could see the glory of Jesus right in front of them. And even then it was veiled. But they could see him walking and speaking and healing and raising and, and we now want to see that glory. And there's, there's no better window into the glory of Jesus than seeing a, someone who loves sin and this world and is transformed so that they love Jesus and are longing for heaven. There's, there's no better sight of God's glory than seeing someone turn away from anger towards God and turn to the love of God by the power of the Holy Spirit regenerating their heart. And since we believe that man in his natural state is dead in sin, we must pray for God to do this. Should we reach out? Yes. Should we build friendships? Yes. Should we share the gospel? Yes. But in the end, only God's power saves souls. And so I think we should fast and declare, I would rather see my neighbor converted than eat this meal. I would rather see my family members saved than enjoy food this day. I'd rather see my elderly parent finally turn to Jesus than have screen time in this morning or evening. And I'm doing this as a way of tangibly saying to you, Lord, what you know is on my heart, but you rejoice to see in my life. I long to see your glory in conversions more than these lesser things. I want to see it. We want to be praying for these things as a church this year, but we're all forgetful, and New Year's resolutions are done by day four, so we thought it'd be good to have a monthly reminder, a review. We're not going to have a sermon on fasting 12 times, just this one, uh, but we are going to do a reminder so that at the, at the first week of that month, after the Sunday, we'll announce it, and following that Sunday, all of us we know together will be doing something, some of us less, some of us more. We all have different capacities, different seasons of life, different bodies, so there's no evaluation of who's doing more, who's doing less. All of us are together declaring this much, Lord. We want you. We want to see your glory in the scriptures. We want to see your holiness in our lives. We want to see conversions in our community. We want to see it so much that we are following the practice of the early church and the people of the Old Testament, and we are setting aside good things gifts in order to declare that we would rather have you even than these things. Let me encourage you. We want our church to see the glory of Jesus Christ in these three ways especially. Let me encourage you also that a a practical, even this week, expression a couple of expressions that you can make as you jump into prayer. Uh, Mike Stelix is going to be leading and hosting a time of prayer. You can see that in your announcements tomorrow night at his house. If you are able to, I'm sure he'd love to have you join him. 
Also, we have weekly prayer on Sunday mornings, but I'd like to ask this year in a particular way, if the second Sunday of the month, if you would consider joining us in that time of prayer. It starts at 9 o'clock on Sundays, right back in this room right over here. So after the week of prayer, we'd love to see in a particular way that week of the month, uh, that prayer room just packed with people. We don't just pray for the Sunday meeting. We pray for people in the church. We pray for nations around the world. We pray for church plants. Uh, we pray for those that are sick. We pray for God to move in various ways in the ministries of our church. We'd love to have you join us that second Sunday. That's next Sunday. We'd love to have you come. But for all of us, let's seize in a particular way these first weeks, first week after the first Sunday, to, to pray, to long for the Lord, to declare our need for him. Our desire is that the result of this, the result of this, even such a simple thing, to that person who said to me, I, I'm always afraid I'll do it wrong. Look, it's, it's very difficult to do it wrong. Don't boast in it. Don't eat something and pray. It, you're not going to do it wrong if you do those three things. Don't boast in it. Don't eat something and pray. You're good. You've done it right. Here's our goal. 1,700 years later, Augustine presents our goal to us. Listen to what he says. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. That's what we're hoping God does in our hearts. That through the discipline of fasting, giving up good things, that all of those fruitless things that often snare us and entangle us and distract us would be displaced and that our hearts would be filled with the one who is the sweetest of all pleasures. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I am so anticipating this practice this year as a church, Lord. I pray that you would bless it. Lord, I, I pray that you would motivate every person, Lord, from the oldest saint, uh, Lord, to the youngest person in this room, to, to take some step of setting aside something to declare their longing for you. Lord, and I pray that you would answer these prayers. Lord, we know because of your word, that we are praying according to your will when we pray for these three things. So, Lord, please answer these prayers, Lord. Hear our heart. Hear our longing. Hear our desire. Reveal your glory in your word. Reveal it, Lord Jesus. Reveal it Sunday after Sunday and in the small group gatherings, Lord, when we're studying your word. Reveal your word to us. Reveal, Lord, your holiness produced by your spirit in our character. Make us more like you. Do that, Lord Jesus. And Lord, save people around us. Turn them from darkness to light. Deliver them from sin to salvation. Rescue them from hell and point them to heaven. Lord, save people. We would rather have that than have food, than have the other pleasures we enjoy. We are presenting the people around us in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our businesses, in our schools. We are presenting them to you, and we are asking that you would save them. We ask for this because of your grace and in your name alone.